Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Last time we stopped with the vision of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he and his companions will go to Mecca al-Mukarramah, perform Umrah, slaughter their hadi, slaughter their uh, camels that they brought with them as the sacrifice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and shave their heads, which means that they have completed the rituals of Al-Umrah. We know that shaving the heads or cutting the hair is one of the signs of tahallul, which we do after we make Umrah or, or after we make Hajj. And the Prophet sallallahu used to give a higher reward to those who completely shave their heads. That's only for males, by the way. Women do not shave their heads. They only cut some of their hair. But uh, uh, in, in, in the later on, when the Prophet sallallahu would make a, a Umrah or a Hajj, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Allahumma ghfir lil muhalliqeen. Allahumma ghfir lil muhalliqeen. Allahumma ghfir lil muhalliqeen. Oh Allah, forgive those who have sh completely shaved their heads uh, to denote the completion of their ritual. And the ones who just cut their head short, al-muqassireen, would ask the Prophet ﷺ, wal-muqassireen, ya Rasulullah, he would give three times the dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive al-muhalliqeen. And then at the end, he would say, wal-muqassireen, and also the ones who cut their hair short. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the meaning of the hadith that with each hair that is shaved, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a reward or remits a sin. So imagine someone with thick hair, the reward that he would get when he shaves that head for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, the sha'air of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have to be respected, have to be maintained, and have to be publicized. We should not shy away from showing our rituals to everyone, whether they are believers or non-believers. So for example, salah is the greatest of our, our rituals. And we know the importance of Salah in Islam. Living in a land that's not predominantly Muslim or that the rituals of Islam are not uh, very common uh, in, in the culture, it's very important to maintain these rituals because this is what distinguishes us as Muslims. So if you're traveling, if the time of Salah comes and there's no masjid close by, Pray wherever you are. Do not worry about people looking at you or asking what are you doing and things of that sort. Again, this is publicizing your faith to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and showing that you are not shy of showing your rituals to other people. And this is full confidence and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not, being, not feeling weak or shy or anything like that. Same thing is for our sisters who, mashallah, are wearing hijab. This is the sign of a Muslimah. So again, you should not be ever shy about that. This is actually your distinction. This is your, uh, your pride. And wear it proudly. Don't disguise it as a hat or something like that. Wear it proudly. And when people ask you, why are you dressed like that? You say, because I am a Muslimah. I am following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cared about showing these, showing pride and showing confidence in these rituals that we show to everyone. Of course, we're not doing it to show off. We're not doing it for the sake of people. We're doing it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whether people see it or not, it doesn't really matter. Whether people like it or not, it doesn't really matter. We only we're only trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that blessed caravan of 1400 people started on its way from al madina al munawwara to Mecca al mukarramah The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was worried about what would be the response of Quraysh. How would Quraysh perceive this intrusion on their land and encroachment on their land? Would they just take it lightly. These are a group of people who want to come for Umrah and visit the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they're going to give them the same privileges as anyone else. Or are they going to take it as a sign of aggression and sign of defiance and therefore try to take it the wrong way and try to fight the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and prevent him from making that Umrah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was worried about that. So when they approached al madina al-Munawwara, and he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by the way, 
again guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with his, his high sense of sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his high sense of security and care for his companions he took a different way so that if there are any hypocrites in al Madina al munawwara they wouldn't know the destination of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam even though he said that they're going to go for Umrah but again he doesn't want the news to travel that fast to Quraysh to, so that they would be prepared. So the Prophet ﷺ took a different way from the customary one, which is straight south. He وسلم, and his uh, group took a detour, and then they started on their way. And the Prophet ﷺ kept sending eyes to watch the road, and basically to see if there are any traps, if Quraysh has heard about them and is waiting for them and is trying to intercept that caravan before they reach Mecca al mukarramah Because once they are in Mecca al mukarramah again, with the rules of Al-Haram that Quraysh wouldn't dare to break, because again, this is their pride, this is their honor, and if it's known that no one is safe in Al-Haram, no one would dare come to Al-Haram, and they would lose their prestige. So if they're going to intercept the Prophet Sallallahu it's going to be before he reaches the sanctuary and the, the, the land that's prohibited around the sanctuary. So the Prophet ﷺ sent these eyes left and right to go and explore and come back to the Prophet ﷺ. And one time, the Prophet ﷺ, when they approached Mecca and Mukarramah, they were less than a day's travel to Mecca and Mukarramah. And Quraysh had no idea until, that, until now. Someone one of the tribes on the way gave an advance notice to Quraysh. So when the Prophet وسلم, sent a, an eye, and that eye was from the tribe of Khuza'ah, the tribe of Khuza'ah, the majority of the tribe of Khuza'ah, by the way, were still non-believers. Regardless of whether they were believers or not, they had their allegiance to the Prophet They trusted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam although they did not follow him. So they wanted him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be safe and sound. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent one of his companions who was from the tribe of Huza'a, a believer, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the tribe of Huza'a, Bisr ibn Sufyan al-Khuza'i radiallahu anhu, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent him to Mecca to explore. Now having family in Mecca, not being known as a great companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had actually just embraced Islam. So now he, he's, he's trusted by the people of Mecca. He uh, went and intermingled with the people of Mecca and saw the preparations. He saw that Mecca heard about the arrival of the Prophet Sallallahu and they took it the wrong way. They took it as a defiance, an act of defiance, an act of aggression. And they decided that we are going to stop him at any price, but we're going to try again to intercept him. So they were planning a small army of 200 people, 200 of their strong warriors, led by Khalid ibn al-Walid, radiallahu anhu, the, the head of their cavalry and one of their bravest uh, fighters. So it was an expeditionary force that was sent to intercept the caravan of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa So Busr ibn Sufyan, came back to the Prophet ﷺ with the news. He snuck out of Mecca and he came back to the Prophet ﷺ with the news. I have seen very high anticipation and very high preparations. Quraysh has made up its mind. They are not going to allow you to enter into Mecca. Who are the leaders of Quraysh at that time? Now, until the end of the fifth year of the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ, you can see that the leadership of Quraysh keeps moving from one individual to another or from one group to another. So in the Battle of Badr, the leader of, leadership of Quraysh was in the hands of Bani Abd Shams, Bani Umayyah in particular. So we had Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shaybah ibn Rabi'ah, and so on. And then when Utbah and Shaybah were killed in the Battle of Badr, the leadership of Quraysh moved from Bani Umayyah to Bani Makhzum. And actually, uh, in, in uh, Abu Jahl, 
was the leader of, of Bani Makhzum and he also was, was killed uh, in, in the fight against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was killed in Badr, but the leadership stayed in Bani Makhzum. Now Ikrimah, the son of Abu Jahl, emerged as a young leader. So one of the leaders of Mecca was Ikrimah. After the Battle of Uhud, now Abu Sufyan emerged as was also from Bani Abd Shams, related to Bani Umayyah. His father-in-law was Utbah ibn Rabi'ah because his, his uh, wife was Hind bin Utbah. So now he claims the leadership of Quraysh. Abu Sufyan himself was a trader. He was a merchant. He was not a man of war. He was not a fighter. He was a very smart man, very smart, very politically astute, but at the same time, he was not a military leader. He could raise funds. He could marshal people, but he could not really lead an expedition. And we have seen that in the Battle of Al-Ahzab when he raised this huge army to invade Medina and with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that effort was fruitless, it was a failure and basically he told his people, let's go back to, uh, to Mecca because we have failed to invade Medina. And that was the second strike for Abu Sufyan. If you remember, the first strike was he was the leader in the Battle of Uhud. He was the leader of the non-believers in the Battle of Uhud. And he became a prominent leader after the partial, what they called victory. It was not a complete victory, of course. It was sort of a tie. And then when he promised the Prophet ﷺ, we're going to come back one year later, Badrul Maw'id. And they did not show up because he heard about the preparation of the Prophet ﷺ. So now some of the young bucks, some of the young leaders of Quraysh are seeing that Abu Sufyan cannot be our leader. He's, he's older. He's very careful. He's not adventurous enough. He cares about his wealth. He cares about his trade. He has the skill of being a good merchant, but he's not a good fighter. They still allowed him to lead the battle in Al-Ahzab, but again, after the, the, the return without being able to invade Medina, they said, you know what? That cannot be our leader. And now we can start seeing three new faces emerging as sort of the collective leadership of Mecca. And these were Akrima ibn Abi Jahl, Safwan ibn Umayyah, his father was from the tribe of Bani Jumah, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, an enemy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was also killed in the battle. So Safwan wanted to get his revenge from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the third one was Suhail ibn Amr from Bani Amr. Suhail ibn Amr was a very smart person, very eloquent speaker. He was a very good orator. He could give very good speeches. Now, a couple of his brothers and a son of his are with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One of his brothers, As-Sakran ibn Amr radiallahu anhu, was one of the early companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he migrated to uh, Al-Habasha, and he passed away in Al-Habasha. And the son of Suhail ibn Amr was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that expedition that's coming to make the Umrah. Another son, Abu Jandal, is in Mecca. He's also a believer, but Suhail kept him in chains preventing him from migrating and joining the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he, for, he is from a strong tribe, Bani Amr. And we, if we remember Bani Amr, this is one of the strong tribes that had betrayed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you remember when we talked about Bi'r Ma'una and Yawm al Raji'ah, uh, Amr ibn Tufail was, was the, the leader of Bani Amr at that time. And he broke the word of his uncle, uh, Abu Bara' Amr ibn Malik. So basically, there are many Amirs in this tribe, and that's why they call it Bani Amir, basically. So Suhail ibn Amr did not have any lost love for the Prophet ﷺ. And now these three are the leadership, the common leadership of Mecca, or the joint leadership of Mecca. And Abu Sufyan took a step back. We don't hear about him much. Again, he's busy with his business, with his trade, very successful merchant, but not the political or the military leader anymore. He lost his clout based on these two failures. So these three leaders, Safwan ibn Umayyah, Suhail ibn Amr, and Ikrim ibn Abi Jahl made up their mind, 
Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is not going to be allowed to come to Al-Haram. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was a few miles away from Al-Haram, from, from Mecca al-Mukarramah. And he kept the camels tied, waiting for the arrival, again, to be slaughtered as a sacrifice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a very hot weather, very dry climate. The Prophet sallallahu sent another eye to go to Mecca after he received the initial report from uh, Busr ibn Sufyan. He sent another guy, also from Khuza'a, Khirash ibn Umayyah, and he went there and he tried to explore what's going on and he was found and people were about to kill him but they beat him and then they released him so he went back to the Prophet ﷺ telling him about what he saw. The Prophet ﷺ wondered why is Quraysh taking that stance? Why would they treat us differently? They have heard that we're coming as Mu'tamirin, we're coming as uh, uh, pilgrims. We're not intending any harm for Quraysh. But again, it's the stubbornness and the arrogance of Quraysh. You're not going to force your way against our will to Mecca. Now the Prophet wasallam heard about this expeditionary force sent by Khalid ibn Walid and he knew who Khalid ibn Walid is. The Prophet wasallam did not care much about facing that uh, force but he did not want to spill the blood of his companions. We came in peace and we want to go back in peace. So he asked his companions, who can take us in a diverted way to bypass Khalid ibn al-Walid and his army? And here come some of the experts of that land who were trying again originally to intercept the Prophet ﷺ on his hijrah. So Buraida radiallahu anhu, Buraida ibn al-Hasib radiallahu anhu steps up and says, Ya Rasulullah, I can show you a detour. So basically they started going around that detour and suddenly, although he was very familiar with this terrain, there was a hill and there were thick trees and a very narrow passage in this hill, he sort of lost his way. He couldn't find any distinguishing marks anymore. And the Prophet ﷺ could see it on his face. He's looking left and right, not knowing exactly where to go next. So the Prophet ﷺ repeated the request, who can take us to uh, the detour? Another companion from Aslam also volunteered. And again, he sort of was lost. And the Prophet ﷺ repeated the request for the third time. And this time, a third expert from Aslam told the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, I can do that. And basically, he kept supplicating to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, it was, now it was completely dark. He said, I saw as if this, the sky was lighted, as if there was uh, a full moon and there was no full moon. And they started passing between this, these, this very narrow street between the trees until they went, they crossed this hill until they went into a very vast open area where they could pass next to each other very easily and in peace. The Prophet ﷺ told them anyone who crosses this hill before sunrise is forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ is asking them to go, to move quickly, to step up quickly. So they all rushed to cross that hill. It was not an easy pass, but the Prophet ﷺ told them, do your best. And they all rushed to cross that hill, except for one individual who was looking for a lost camel. And when he was told that the Prophet ﷺ said, everyone is going to be forgiven if they cross it before sunrise, he said, I care about my camel more than anything else. So completely misguided, subhanAllah. And they passed that hill, and once they passed it and they landed in that open area, the Prophet ﷺ said, Qulu nastaghfirullah wa natubu ilayh. Say, we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness, and we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Prophet ﷺ told them, you know, this is the hitta, this is the remission of the sins 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had offered Bani Israel. وَقُولُوا حِطَّةٌ نَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ And say, O oh Allah, remit our sins. Say these same words, نَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ But they refused. They changed the words instead of saying hitta, they said hinta, which is something like barley or a certain grain. And they started mocking Sayyidina Musa ala Nabina wa alayhi salatu wasalam. That's why they were lost in the desert for 40 years because of their mockery of the revelation and their uh, disobedience to their messenger Sayyidina Musa ala Nabina wa alayhi salatu wasalam. Now the companions are feeling a great relief because again they have been given this pardon from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wants to send a negotiator, someone to go to Mecca and negotiate, not an I, but someone to meet with the leaders of Mecca and negotiate a settlement with them, some compromise or some agreement. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, brave, strong, strong will, he told Sayyidina Umar, Ya Umar, go and talk to the people of Mecca. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu said, I am not the man. I do not have any strong family to protect me in Mecca. And you know how the people of Mecca hate me so much. But I'm going to tell you, O Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about another man who has a strong family that can protect him and they don't hate him as much as they hate me. Who was that? It was Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu the son-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu from Bani Umayyah, the de facto leaders of Mecca, who could be a better uh, emissary or negotiator on behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu to Mecca to negotiate with the people of Quraysh. When they saw him, they welcomed him. They said, welcome, Uthman, come. And they, they knew that the Prophet ﷺ wants to negotiate. Let's see what he has. And they showed him great hospitality. And even they told him, listen, since now you are in Mecca, if you want to make a Umrah, we're going to allow you to make a Umrah. You can go and make Tawaf and Sa'i and everything. And he said, no, I cannot do that before the Prophet ﷺ. I'm here, on, although it's a very good offer, I appreciate that, but I'm not going to do it before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I am here for a certain mission, which is to negotiate on behalf of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Quraysh were really stubborn. And basically the negotiations took a few days. They're thinking, they're trying to make up their mind. What are we going to do? Are we going to prevent them breaking the rules of Al-Haram? Or are we going to allow them and the Arabs are going to say that he came here despite our will and he forced his way. So basically, it's a dilemma. During these days, rumors came back from Mecca to the camp of the Prophet ﷺ that Quraysh has killed Sayyidina Uthman. It's been three days. We have not heard from him. So maybe these rumors are true. And the Prophet ﷺ called all of his companions. Now come. He stood up and said, come to me. He was standing under a big tree and he وسلم, called his companions, come to me, come pledge to me. And they made their pledge to the Prophet وسلم, not to run away from him, to support him, to defend him, to fight with him, regardless of the consequences. Sayyidina Salam ibn al anhu, one of the great companions of the Prophet وسلم, uh, a side note about Sayyidina Salam ibn al-Akwa, he was a sprinter. He was a very fast runner. When he ran, no one could catch him and he could race against a horse and sometimes even beat a horse. So he was extremely fast in running. So the Prophet وسلم, saw him and said, Salama, come and make the pledge. So Sayyidina Salam radiallahu anhu made the pledge to the Prophet وسلم, and then in the middle, again, they came, they used to come in groups. So he was one of the very first to make that pledge to the Prophet ﷺ. And then came a second group and the Prophet ﷺ saw him and said, Salama, come and make the pledge. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I did. He said, come another time. And he came back and made the pledge to the Prophet ﷺ the second time. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him a shield to protect himself. 
And then later on with the last group, the Prophet Sallallahu saw him, Salama, common pledge. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I did it twice. He said, again, a third time. And then when he came to make the pledge the third time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, what did you do with the, with the shield that I gave you? He said, I gave it to my uncle to protect himself. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled at the generosity and how this companion cared about his uncle more than he cared about himself. So the Prophet Sallallahu even joked with him and he said, uh, you are just like what the poet said, Allahumma bghini habiban ahabbu ilayya min nafsi. Oh Allah, give me a, a, a friend or, or someone that I love. I love more than I love myself. This is how the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to treat each other. And when it, he was asked later on, on what did you pledge or what did you pledge to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, Bayana Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ala al-mawt. We pledge to him that we are going to die protecting him and protecting Islam. So they were very serious. Quraysh started sending on, as they had Sayyidina Uthman as a messenger from the Prophet ﷺ, they started sending their own messengers to try to negotiate with the Prophet ﷺ. So they initially sent one of the leaders of Al-Ahabish. Al-Ahabish is a group of minor tribes and allies who used to live in Mecca, not belonging to one particular tribe, but multiple small tribes. They had one leader, al hulays ibn Al-Qamah. And the, this was a large group in Mecca that represented the workforce of Mecca, if, if you will. So they sent al hulays ibn Al-Qamah to negotiate with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is a man who used to respect the rituals of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the Prophet Sallallahu recognized that. So he Sallallahu said, send the camels in front of you. Show him that we came with the hadi, with the sacrifice, that we came as Umar, as to make Umrah, not to fight. So when al hulays was about to, to come to the camp of the Prophet Sallallahu he saw the camels tied in the desert, eating their own uh, hair out of hunger. He went back to Quraysh and said, this is a man who did not come for a fight. This is a camel man who came for rituals. Allow him to allow him access to Mecca. And Quraysh mocked him and he said, you are, you're, you're not one of us. You don't even know what you're talking about. He told them, listen, you are going to let him pass and make Umrah or I swear I'm going to lead the Ahabish in a revolt against you and I'm going to topple this whole regime in Mecca. They told him, please, please calm down. Let's, let's see what we can do. So now they sent the second messenger, another leader from Al-Ta'if, from Taqif, Urwa ibn Mas'ud. Urwa ibn Mas'ud is a leader of Taqif. Taqif is the second large village not too far from Mecca. So they sent Urwa ibn Mas'ud to try to negotiate with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Urwa ibn Mas'ud came until he met with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sat face to face to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and look at his bad manners and his arrogance. He did not know who the Prophet, how to treat the Prophet ﷺ. So he held the beard of the Prophet ﷺ and kept pulling him ﷺ. He tried to put his hand on the beard of the Prophet ﷺ and there was a guard standing above the head of the Prophet ﷺ that hit him on the hand very strongly. And he said, oh, that hurts. And then he tried again to approach and again, he was hit on the hand one more time. He said, oh, how tough you are. And then he asked the Prophet, who is this tough guy? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled, this is your nephew, Al-Mughir ibn Shu'bah. And Urwa said, you ingrate person, I just paid the money, the blood money for the people that you have just killed. And this is the way to treat me? He told him, keep your hand to yourself before it does not return back to you. If you dare extend your hand to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Urwa ibn Mas'ud is a smart man. He's watching around him, seeing how the people are treating the Prophet ﷺ with great respect. So he went back to Quraysh telling them, listen, I have been to Kisra in his palace. I have been to Qaisar, Caesar, in his palace. And I have seen how the people around them treat them. I have never seen anyone treat their leader as I've seen the companions of Muhammad treat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So here's my advice to you. I saw people with him who are like lions, and they are not going to run away from him. They are not going to surrender him. They are going to die before we can reach him. So if you want my advice, let him come and make the Umrah and then go back safely. Second advice to Quraysh, Hulays ibn al qamah and now Urwa ibn Mas'ud. Quraysh, again, stubborn, arrogant. They said, no. So now they want to send someone who can really speak on their behalf. And who did they choose to speak on their behalf? One of that triumvirate of leadership, Suhail ibn Amr. They say, Suhail, now these people were completely useless. You go and you go and negotiate yourself. So Suhail ibn Amr said, all right, I am going to go and negotiate, but the condition is whatever I decide, whatever we reach, don't treat me like the other two. You're going to follow my advice. And they said, of course, you are a respected leader. We trust you. So you go and negotiate. And whatever you decide, we are going to follow your decision. So now Suhail ibn Amr embarked on his way to join, to meet with the Prophet wasallam to try to negotiate a certain kind of settlement or compromise. Inshallah, next time we're going to talk about what took place between Suhail ibn Amr and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and what was the commentary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this event and what was the response of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to this event. So until next time, inshallah, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.